As sports history fans, we often reminisce about the legends. Willis Reed limping on to the NBA Finals Court, Kurt Schilling's bloody sock, Kerry Strug's courageous dismount, and so many more. These moments often define sports history. But what about the countless injuries that did not become legends or careers that were derailed due to inadequate care? That's where this episode sponsor comes in. Introducing to you, ILP Sports Consultants, your trusted sports injury partner available 24-7. Brian Maelli at ILP Sports Consultants has over 20 years of experience in the orthopedic and sports medicine industry, and he has worked with athletes across the gamut, from youth to amateurs, professionals, in almost every sport played in the United States of America, accommodating athletes at every stage of their career. This adaptability ensures that ILP services are perfectly tailored to your skill level, no matter where you are in your athletic journey. With ILP, you are in control. Choose the steps that matter most to you. Diagnosis, treatment plan, recovery, or the whole journey. ILP services are tailored to your unique needs. Rushing for care is a common pitfall leading to future problems. ILP Sports Consultants helps you make the right decisions, ensuring that you receive timely and safe care. And here's a bonus. Brian hosts the Injured List podcast, sharing insights and athlete stories you won't want to miss. Whether you're a concerned parent or grandparent or an athlete yourself seeking guidance, ILP Sports Consultants is your beacon of hope in sports injury management. Visit ILPSports.com today. That's the letters ILP Sports.com. ILP Sports Consultants, where your well being is the priority and your recovery is the mission. Choose ILP Sports Consultants for a healthier sports journey, helping you get back in the game the smart way. I'm sure many of us have heard the old adage to have two dogs in one bone. Well, what about that happens? when you have three undefeated college football teams and one mythical national championship. We're going to find that out in the 1937 football season right here on Football History Rewind, part number 80, coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And welcome to another edition of the Football History Rewind, where we will go back in time and look at football history year by year. And this time, for this 80th episode of the series, we are going to look at the 1937 college football season. And boy, was it a memorable one. With several teams competing for the nation's top spot. It also had some legendary players, coaches, and a rule modification that would make a change to the game forever. We're going to talk about all that and more in just a moment. But before we do, let's make sure you're aware of our daily newsletter. You can find out everything that's going on in the pig pen. That's Pigskin Dispatch. That's Jersey Dispatch, Orville Mulligan Sports Trader, and all of our other projects that we have going on. And we have a lot going on, including a, a book that's going to be coming out. Uh, we hope to have some other things for you, too, coming up here in the next uh, few months. So we hope to entertain you with that. And we have it all there, plus our friends from the Sports History Network. So every day, 6.30 a.m. Eastern, you have a right in your news in your newsletter in your email inbox you'll have our newsletter so uh make sure you check that out and uh easy to sign up for just go to the show notes of this podcast or go to pigskindispatch.com at the top now the rules revisions of 1937 now this was a big change to the uniform and uh you know, this may be even something we should be talking about on jersey dispatch but it's really important because a new rule revision saw that player jersey numbers were to be worn on the front and the back and it became mandatory for the NCAA action for the first time in history. 
This included mandates that the numbering on the front were to be six inches high in Arabic style numbers and the back of the players was to be a 10 inch high Arabic numeral to match the number that was on the front. Player identification was very important and look where we are today. That's how we recognize a lot of our players and who's doing what on the football field. Uh, also great for penalties and uh, you know things like that as well. So uh, and you know, one of the byproducts is they were able to sell uh, game cards or game programs, uh, which ke- became really popular there for many decades. Uh, now people pull things up on their phones, so not as important. But uh, just think about that, those paper things that people uh, often collect even to this day. Now, we had a lot of contenders going on in 1937, mainly three of them. Uh, The University of Pittsburgh was sort of the surprise team of the season. Coach Jock Sutherland was still at the helm after the highly successful 1936 Panthers season, which saw them become the national champions of that when they end up going in and winning the Rose Bowl game that uh, sort of tied the knot for them and made them officially the best team. But remember, they're choosing the best team before bowl season back then. But that squad from 1936 lost a couple of stalwarts on the line from the earlier team, like All-American tackle, Ave Daniel, and guard Bill Glassford. Those two gents are gone, uh, not on the team anymore, but they still had a couple stars with them in Marshall Goldberg and Tony Matisse. Uh, were you know still there uh, so Panthers were a little less dominant than in 1936 but they actually had a better record 9-0-1 versus 8-1-1 that prior year when they won the national championship now Goldberg was an All-American and finished third in the Heisman Trophy voting in 1937 and he'd repeat as an All-American status in 1938 and he was a runner-up for the Heisman that year Now, he would go on to have a successful professional career with the Chicago Cardinals, and his famed number 99 jersey eventually was retired by the Cardinals franchise. If you remember a a year or two ago when the Arizona Cardinals picked up J.J. Watt, Watt got special uh, permission, uh, dispensation from the Goldberg family to uh, release that number 99 so he was allowed to wear it. And then it went back in retirement, I think, when when J.J. Watt left the team. But uh, quite an honor for him. Now, Matisse was a consensus first-team pick at the tackle position. The tackle would end up being a fourth-round selection by his hometown Pittsburgh Steelers in the 1938 NFL Draft. But he played five games in his rookie season, not for the Steelers, but for the Detroit Lions. The Steelers didn't keep him on their team. But they had a, a very well-rounded roster. Now, the toughest contest for the Pitt Panthers on the season may have been when the Panthers traveled to the Polo Grounds in New York to play the Fordham Rams. They had three years in a row where they played Fordham at the Polo Grounds under a contract. Now, Jim Crowley's Rams were 2-0 and on the season. And if you remember that name Jim Crowley, that's because he had been one of the famed four horsemen of Notre Dame. So he learned... A lot about football from his coach Newt Rockney. Now the Fighting Irish connection did not stop with Crowley for Fordham. The legendary seven blocks of granite line, uh, you know, very famous line, uh, they were coached by Hall of Famer Frank Leahy who went on to be a very successful head coach back at his alma mater Notre Dame. So that Notre Dame and Fordham connection very strong there. Now, Fordham on their roster had two All-Americans, just like uh, Pitt did. 1937, and tackle Ed Franco and center Alex Wojohowicz. Now, Fordham's Achilles heel was most likely their strength of schedule. The only other ranked team they played in 1937 was number 15, North Carolina, where the Rams defeated handily 14 to nothing at Chapel Hill. But the Rams also knocked off a tough, unranked Texas Christian who featured Hall of Famers Davey O'Brien and Key Aldrich. So you know, they were very much uh, equal to Pitt. And as you can see, they ended up uh, having a tie game with them. Uh, the game with Pitt, they secured, uh, Pitt secured 11 first downs. So they sort of dominated compared to Fordham's four first downs. But the Rams defense would not allow the Panthers to score. 
At least that is what the 0-0 final score indicated. Although a Goldberg touchdown was called back on a Matisse holding call. And ironically, it was the third straight year that the Rams and the Panthers in that series game ended in a tie at the Polo Grounds. For the end of the season, Pitt finished 9-0-1, Fordham 7-0-1, and both were viable candidates for that mythical national title. But there was another team out west that we're going to talk about right after this. If you have ever seen a sports story on TV or online or maybe in a newspaper, chances are once upon a time you have seen it before. Hello, I'm Dana Augusta, former sports writer and now podcaster, and I host a show called Historically Speaking Sports, where we place a historical spin on a current sports headline or take the topic that most people are talking about and compare and contrast it through the lens of sports history. In this show, we talk to researchers, authors, and other sports history connoisseurs about what fans and analysts are talking about, yet in the terms of sports history. We also do a weekly top five countdown, highlighting moments that pertain to the subject of the show or the five greatest moments in the history of sports that took place that week. And to complete the show, we send a shout out to a famous sports figure or moment in sports history that both pertains to that episode or someone who had a dramatic role in sports history or an event in history that fans just need to be reminded of. The show, Historically Speaking Sports, where we put a historical spin on sports headlines. That's Historically Speaking Sports, right here on the Sports History Network. Hey, this is Del Reed, co-founder of Bill's Mafia and founder of 26shirts.com, where behind every shirt there is a story, and you are listening to the Pigskin Dispatch. All right, we talked about two of the three contenders uh, before the break in Pitt and Fordham, who both were undefeated. They tied each other, 9-0-1 for the Panthers, Fordham 7-0-1. But out west, there was another team that uh, sort of had a, a good candidate, was a good candidate for the national championship. 1937 edition of the University of California football. They were nicknamed the Thunder Team. It was a third year under head coach Stubb Allison for Cal, who compiled a 10-0-1 record. The Bears were dominant to the point of shutting out 7 of 11 opponents and outscored all opposition by a total of 214-33 to on the season. The victories of the Thunder Team included a 26 drubbing of the number 11 ranked team in the nation, rival USC, and the end of the year 13-0 blanking of another f- annual foe in number 13, Stanford. Their tie, though, came at the hands of the Washington Huskies, who battled California to a scoreless draw. Star Vic Boteri was hurt going into the contest and didn't get up until the game until the third quarter, where she did get into play, and the team may have been less effective with him in the lineup, wounded. Now, the Bears had a late scare in the fourth quarter when the Husky moved the ball to the Cal 23-yard line and then subsequently missed a field goal attempt that would have won the game uh, for Washington. The stalemate cost Cal dearly as they swapped places with Pitt from Cal being in the top spot in the nation to trail position at number two, with the Panthers moving up to that number one and not relinquishing. The Bears fullback Sam Chapman was the team's only All-American selection in 1937, uh, compared to two for Fordham and two for Pitt. So you had three undefeated teams now, Cal, Fordham, and Pitt. That season in 1937 was also very notable for the fact that it was the first season in which the AP poll would be used in helping to determine who was the national champion. Now, the AP poll first started and was published in 1936. It was sort of an experiment that year. was not at all really used to determine who the national champion was. Uh, but this 1937 year, it was a big factor. In it. But the final AP poll came out prior to the Rose Bowl game, came out when the regular season ended, where the Cal Bears destroyed Alabama and the Rose Bowl to, to, to finish with a stellar 10-0-1 record, but they didn't get to count that Rose Bowl game, which may have maybe swayed the voters just a little bit in the AP poll. So end of the season, Pitt had that number one spot, as we talked about, Cal number two, Fordham number three. Pitt is deemed as the national champion. Now, Clint's 
Frank of Yale was the Heisman Trophy winner, and he led the Bulldogs to a perfect 9-0 record. Now, Clinton edged out Colorado's Byron Wizard White for the honor that year, and the Yale back Clinton rushed for 667 yards and passed for 489 yards and five touchdowns, caught one pass for six yards, and intercepted four for 70 yards and returned five punts for 28 yards and four kickoffs for 81 yards scored 11 touchdowns in total he was a busy guy never left the field there and clinton left the eli with 1244 career rushing yards on his collegiate career 937 passing yards five receptions and a remarkable 11 interceptions and 20 touchdowns now looking back the experts were somewhat split on deciding who that top team was in the land for the season. Pittsburgh earned that number one spot, as we talked about, in the AP poll, and retroactively in the college football researchers and the National Championship Foundation. The Golden Bears, well, they were the top dog in the California-based Helms selection process. Helms uh, you know, kept stayed true to the West Coast roots. They had Cal. So we never really know who would have won that championship if uh, they would have invited maybe Pittsburgh and you know Cal to play in the Rose Bowl, then maybe we'd have a little bit more clarity on it. But uh, like we said, Cal uh, beat up Alabama pretty good in that one to win the Rose Bowl game, and uh, goes down in history as uh, you know being sort of a split uh, mythical national championship. And I guess we'll never know, but we had three great teams that were undefeated, and we can celebrate them for sure and celebrate that college football season and all the great players and coaches that were in that to help make the game what it is today. So, gosh, we're sure glad that you were able to join us here for another bit of football history on the Football History Rewind. We hope that you will come back next time. We have some more great football history coming to you. And look forward to our next edition of the Football History Rewind, uh, part number 81. We'll talk about the 1937 professional season in the coming days and weeks. Uh, But we have plenty of more special programming for you, uh, including tomorrow. We'll have Timothy P. Brown on our Football Archaeology Tuesday to talk about another interesting tidbit that he has been talked about in the football of yesteryear and antiquity and uh, what makes the game great. So till next time, everybody. Have a great, great iron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians. You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.